So really interesting to see the data and the cases, especially. And you know, I'm going to ask the audience that last Manoj asked me to talk about real time CG. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands and say, how many people do you have who are using real time continuous CG? Do I have people who are using real time? Huh? But you have some. Because okay. I was, as you were speaking and I was listening to the talk, sorry I was, if I was disturbing you, but your talk was giving me some thoughts in my mind about what we might say and what might be different. I'm just going to use a couple of minutes to um, maybe come back. So you made a really interesting comment that how long data do you need to um, judge is someone stable? You see one day, but you've seen, all of you see that every day is different. And just a comment there, the 14-day recommendation that Abbott do is based on some work by Rich Bergenstrom. And they use data from type 1 diabetes. And they took a long duration of data and started cutting down. And they said, after how many days will we still get the same result as we would get at three months data? So I've done the same analysis as well, but with a slightly different angle. Because the bottom line is that depends on the patient's stability. A type 2 patient with good C peptide who's got a stable profile, within three days, you get a clear picture because it's reproducible. Someone who's got a, and you showed two very variable profiles, saying one is behavioral and one is physiological. And I completely agree, but there's one other factor that comes into that. And that is how much residual C peptide you have. The best marker of residual C peptide without measuring it is duration of insulin therapy. So once you go past five years of insulin therapy, then the C peptide starts to come down and then you start to get more variability. It's shown in devote data as well. So that's just a marker that once you get low C peptide, then those behavioral differences will yield a bigger difference. So what we showed was that. We looked at baseline C peptide and baseline variability, and we showed that if someone's really variable, no C peptide type ones, actually to get the same time in range, I took a year of data, and I collapsed it down. So you see, okay, how, what's the minimum amount of data you need? So for some people to get the same time in range that you had in a year, you need to take three months of data, ten weeks. They're really variable. We divided our data into four quartiles. Patient who's the most stable, who's managing really well, then ten days you get a, an equitable picture. So there's something about that. If your first three days, if it's quite stable, you can re, you know that in the next 10 days, you're gonna get the same result. If the first three days are really different. You need to wait a little longer, to see what's happening. That was just a, 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 I'll, in the UK now, you know, when we started doing CGM, so I also started using the CGM Gold devices in 2001. And then I used to look at these snake plots and I, I like the snake plots rather than the AGP because you get the individual things and I can kind of see it that where are you seeing overcorrection or a meal uh, replacement. In the UK now, all of our type ones are using CGM mainly for their care. And you know, we have the same choice of devices around the, uh, and part of our job now is to fit the right device to the right patient. Who wants which one? They're all available on the NHS, some different criteria. I wanted to make one comment that we've, that I hear a lot here, that and in around the world as well, that there's a lot of discrepancy. Patient does a finger prick, does a libre, and sees a difference. Yeah, and that confuses it. So different people have different opinions, and I'll tell you mine. And my opinion is all the devices have a quoted MARD. MARD is the average difference of less than 10%. This magic number of 10% comes from one guy, Boris Kovachev, who did some mathematical calculation. He's a mathematician, not a clinician. And he decided that if you do less than 10% error, your chances of a problematic decision are very low. But I think there's a problem with this. To my mind, I've said on the top, what I say to my patient, frequency of measurement beats accuracy. Because if you think about it, the patient says, oh, I was, sensor said I was low, but I was not low. Then the patient doesn't trust the sensor. And then the patient, every time he looks at the sensor, he finger pricks. Look, if you're going to finger prick, why the hell are you spending money on the sensor? You might as well trust the finger break, right? And so you take yourself down that thought process. Say, well, if the sensor says you're low and you treat it, what's the worst that will happen? You weren't really low, but you went a bit high. And every once in a while that will happen. Right? If the sensor is reading high and you treat it, what will happen? If you feel low, you'll get some symptoms. And whether your symptom if your symptoms come on, you're going to treat it anyway. And over the course of time, 
because you've got a sensor now, you'll be scanning or looking at the data 10, 15 times a day. With finger pricks, even the best patients, you know, would do maybe four or five finger pricks a day. So frequency of seeing those high readings and making the difference beats any few events when you've over-treated a hypo. So my recommendation to all the patients is, look, there's always a difference, but just trust what the sensor says, make that your new reality, because if you don't, if you don't trust it, then you won't use it. And the evidence says that people who don't cross-check it have the same outcome as people who do cross-check it. So this is not just a thought. We're talking about evidence-based medicine. And in evidence-based, 90% of people don't do any finger prick. And 10% of people don't trust it. They do the finger prick. They see early on and they keep checking. The outcomes are exactly the same. We, or the other thing to remember is when you're using blinded CGM, IPO, day one always underreads. And day one always gives you more hypoglycemia. So if you see hypos on day one, count them. They're not really true, right? That's just an important thing on day one of the sensor. Um, yeah, all the zones. So this is something called an error grid. And what they do is you see on the bottom, they'll plot the real glucose on the vertical line, the sensor glucose. And all the sensors basically, if you come into those categories, A, D, and C, or that's when the difference is so big that you'd have made a treatment decision. If you're and that actually 5% of the time is going to make an error, and that's, that's acceptable. So the way we make the most of real-time CGM is that if you're spending money, certainly in the Indian scenario where you're paying your own money to use CGM, then look at it. These are 10 rules that were taken from the GOLD trial in the U.S. This is the trial of Dexcom in type 1, in, uh, type 1 diabetes. And if you look at it, what they said was, number one, wear it as much as possible. When CGM first came out, so 10 years ago in the UK, it was all self-funded CGM, very similar to what's happening in India. And people say, I'll wear it one month, one week a month, the Medtronic one, or I'll wear it intermittently. The evidence for usage was very clear that to get a change in A1C, you need to wear it more than 70% of the time. So people wearing it one week and then not wearing it in real time. The evidence in the studies showed there was no change in A1C. That is now a waste of money. That's a waste of your, but if you're, if you're committing to use it, you want to use it at least 70% of the time. The evidence said that in type 1 diabetes, clearly, in type 1 diabetes, you wear it for a week and then not for a week. So in those days, people might, uh, adolescents, young children, started using it, okay, we'll use it in the exercise period, in exam period, patient's going away, child is going away, somewhere when there's a high risk of hypoglycemia, they might use it intermittently in those sort of periods just for, a quality of life benefit. But if you're thinking my A1C is going to improve long term using it intermittently, lots of people have tried it, and every single data has shown that people wearing it less than 70% of the time have zero impact on their A1C. That's the first thing to say. In type 2 diabetes now, there's lots of studies trying to see whether intermittent use can have a benefit, and maybe because in early type 1, like Monojo was saying, when you're making dietary interventions, when you're making therapeutic interventions, because you're changing treatment makes a difference. We, in fact, we used to do a lot of blinded iPro. In, uh, at King's, we used to do 300 iPros a year. So I audited over four years. We've done this in 900, 1,000 cases. Let's look at what the A1C was when they came back next time. In King's, a third of the people improved, a third of the people got worse, and a third of the people made no difference. To one single iPro. So we sometimes overestimate it, what it does. So, but if you're wearing routine CGM, wear it as much as possible, look at it as much as possible. There's very good evidence that people who look at it more have better outcomes. I like this line, it's very American, isn't it? It's awesome, but it's not perfect, right? And so when people say, look, it said it's high, it said it's low, I've got connectivity issues, you say, right. On the whole, look at the big picture, people wearing CGM have a 0.5 to 1% lower A1C than people who don't wear CGM, 70% of the time. So there are times when it's not out there, but in the big picture, it's getting you there. So we always say this for people with type 1 diabetes, that it's a long game. A single reading of 300 or 40 is not going to make any difference to your long-term care. What's going to make the difference is what's the average over the next 10 years. And having a short period of great control or a short period of higher A1C actually doesn't make any difference in the long term. So that's just something. Getting alerts, adjust your settings, have a plan for alerts, don't overreact. When people first start using it, they see something coming down, overreact, go high, see a high, overreact, bring low, and sometimes looking at it too much causes more fluctuation, causes worse control, occasionally. 
Um, what I've learned from there is actually you can look at it and make lots of behavior modifications, but you've got to make sure that the structure of the therapy is correct. And I'd really recommend for all people on multiple daily injections, type 1 or type 2, always check what the balance is between basal and bolus split. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, in India we need more because you have a high carb meal. Actually, the West, in the US, in the UK, we also have high carb meals. People eat a lot of pasta, a lot of, uh, a lot of desserts. Yeah, people are eating 200 grams of carb a day, which is, I don't think you eat more than that in India, actually. Huh? Might be a little bit more than 200. If it's 200, maybe your basal bowl is split. I think it still remains the same. It still remains the same because you still need to cover it off. So make sure whenever you're seeing someone that I see a lot of people being top heavy. You have quick acting 10, 12, 15 units and basal is 10 or 15. So you get 30 units on the top and 10 units at the bottom. Just once you rebalance it out. So we do a lot of control or delete. Look at your total daily dose over the last seven days. Put 50% as basal. And the number of times I've gone for someone's been on four or five units of basal and uh, 10 units TDS of quick. Okay, your total dose is 40. You're going to be on 20 basal and I'm going to reduce your quick acting. Immediately the trace flattens out. The more top heavy you are, the more variability you're going to get. The more bottom heavy you are, the more stable you're going to be. Carb ratio should be 350 by total daily dose and your correction factor should be 2000 or 2100 by total daily dose. We always go aggressive bolus, soft correction. What typically patients do is I'm scared of hypo. I'm going to under bolus. Then they have a high reading. They correct the high reading, they have a hypo. Then they're scared so they under bolus even more. And that gives you high variability. That's just a common behavioral pattern you see in type 1s. Um, so, so, that, so where does that come from? Correct. So this comes from modern teaching. So, so that was, so I'll tell you, very good question. I get asked this a lot. I get asked this a lot. So that comes from a guy called John Walsh, who is a diabetes educator in Texas. And it's his practice, he set it up and he made these rules of, uh, it's called the 500-100 rule, or which in the UK, in India, it becomes 500-1800 rule, right? I used that for the first five, six years when I started doing stuff. And I found that every time I was getting high post meals and corrections and correction high post. So I just tinkered with it a little bit. And I, what I did was I looked at people who are doing really well. And I reverse calculated what they were using. So, you know, patient starts off on a 500-100 rule. Patient comes to clinic, has some problems. The clinician adjusts the therapy or the patient adjusts themselves. And you look at people who are really stable. So I pick the top 10% of my clinic in Kings. We had 2,500 type 1s. You see the people doing well. And I kept reverse calculating what comes out. And I found they were at this sort of relationship. Then I started saying, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start everybody on this. For the last 10 years, I've been using these ratios. They're now in the British guidelines. So where did that come from? That came from John Walsh. Where did this come from? This come from Pratik Chaudhary. There is... Nineteen ninety nine, but correction. <laughs> Doing the maths is difficult, right? So, so yeah. So, where, that's where did that come from? That came. From, none of these have been tested. There is one paper by someone called A King, and that paper they reviewed all the cases and they also came out with three fifty or three hundred to three fifty, being more aggressive with the bolus because typically people undercount their carbs, right? And being soft with your correction, so when you're correcting, you don't you reduce the hypoglycemia risk. So that's. That's, that's why it's from, but good question, yeah. Um, second thing is when people have arrows, they get really freaked out. Right? And a big problem that happens, you see a down arrow, your sugar might be 140, 150, and people do a hypo treatment at 140. So a, a big a discussion that I do with my patients of CGM is saying, okay, what does the arrow mean? So the arrow going down means it's between one to two milligram per deciliter per minute. That doesn't mean anything to the patient. So what we say is, how much is going to change in 30 minutes? You convert it. So in milligram per deciliter, it's much easier than in millimoles. So say it's it's dropping one arrow means it's going to drop by 30 in 30 minutes. So if you're 140, that you have that much time before you're going to get hypo, right? So the thing to do is to check again in that time, not to treat it now. So this is how you don't panic when you're going low. And if you're below 100, we have a pretty simple rule. If you're below 100 and you're dropping by one arrow, you take five grams. So in India. In UK, we have jelly babies. I don't know, what's the Indian equivalent of 5 grams? Someone will tell me. Haribo is one Haribo. One, thoda se charm, charm, manuk. 
two glucose tabs. One glucose tablet is four grams. Glucovita, one tablet is two grams. Okay. So it's four grams if you've got one arrow, and it's eight grams if you've got two arrows. And what that does is, the way I explain this, if you're on the center line of the highway, and your car is drifting a little bit, let's say, no, if you're, on the, if you're going right to the edge, and barrier may, it's going to hit, you make a big jerk. That is your original treatment, hypo treatment of 15 grams, which you advise, which no one takes 15 grams, everyone takes 50 grams. Right? And now what you're saying is, if you're on the middle lane, and you're just drifting a little bit, don't do that same jerk. If you're going to crash into the other barrier. Do a small turn. So there's no logic of taking 40, 50 grams when you're not even hypo. Right? So we say fast acting carb. So I think across, across Western Europe, our advice is take a fast acting carb and straighten the arrow. But a small amount. Right? Now the question about long acting carbs, so the traditional treatment is take 15 grams of treatment now and then take a long acting carb after. That was built for Actrapid or Insulatard particularly nighttime hypos from insulatard, which would give you a long action. With rapid acting analogs, most hypos occur at, I'll say 70% of hypos occur two and a half hours after the meal. Right? So as I tell the fun. So, rebound is something different that's post meal. I'm saying when people are type 1s, type 1s will bolus. And if they've over-treated, the hypo happens at two and a half hours later. By which time your active insulin is really low. So you only need 5-10 grams of carb and that's enough. You don't need the complex carbs. You only need the complex carbs if your hyper is within one hour of the meal. If it's happened just after the meal, then you've got a lot of active insulin, so you need the second complex carbs. But when your hyper happens at 3 or 4 hours post-meal, 4 or 5 grams is enough and that avoids the rebound high after. But okay, one thing. This is my, my, favorite, uh, my favorite slide. So I used to explain. Give me two. This is what I used to explain how to use CGM. In fact, to use it to how to how to use finger prick readings as well for people with type 1 diabetes. Right? Just like if you're playing golf, the idea is you want to get the ball in the hole near the flag, right? So you just like the golfer sees how far is that flag, which way is the wind blowing, where is the trees in the lake, and he chooses there they choose which club to use. Is it a four or five or a nine? How heavy it is and how hard I have to hit, how to accommodate the wind. Similarly, you look at your carbs, you look at your glucose, you think about what activity I'm doing, what work I'm doing, and you choose your dose, right? There is, if you hit the flag in one shot, it's a fluke, right? If your calculations are correct, it means you land it on the green between 70 and 180, 60% of the time. If you're hitting 80, 180 at four hours, 60% of the time, your calculations are all correct. Your carb ratio is correct, your basal is correct. If everything is correct, even then, 5% of the time, you're going to hit hypo. And after hypo, things will be a bit st stupid because you'll treat it, and that's okay. You don't have to change your therapy, your settings, because you're having that. That is going to happen 5% of the time. And 30% of the time, you're going to be high. So you have to check it and see where did I end so that you can make the second shot and correct it and bring it back on target. Because people say I, the commonest thing I hear in clinic around the world is, Talks about I eat the same thing every day. I do the same thing. My sugars are always different. That's because the wind is always blowing differently. The ground is always different. Your sleep is different. Your stress is different. All those things. That's what I was saying. People misjudge, overtreat. If you want to look at it, I was just going to say this last. There's lots of resources we put on. These are all patient-facing resources. If your patients can understand English, okay, then um, that last slide. Hang on. If you Google uh, ABCD DTN UK, DTN UK education, then these are all the videos. There's a lot of pregnancy videos as well for those who do pregnancy of CGM in pregnancy, and there's lots of Libre hyperglycemia using arrows. All of this stuff is there. So DTN UK education. If you Google, there are all all the videos are there for you. Thank you.